Tell me what you remember about that morning. I remember footsteps. Thousands and thousands of footsteps passing by the end of my drive. It was in the very early morning. It was half five or six. I was in work. I had a special pass to drive on the road because traffic was restricted. And uh, as I drove by these people, it was like driving by refugees on the move. There wasn't just a couple of thousands. There was thousands and thousands and thousands all heading for the Phoenix Park. They weren't speaking. It was just the footsteps. And if you stopped, you could hear the dawn chorus above their footsteps. It was very moving. It was eerie, but it was also moving. Let history record that at a difficult moment in the experience of the people of Ireland, the Bishop of Rome set foot in your land, that he was with you. Like St. Patrick, I too have heard the voice of the Irish calling to me. It hardly seems like 20 years since John Paul II got down on his knees and kissed the ground in Dublin Airport. It was one of those great television moments, like Armstrong stepping onto the moon, and it was equally symbolic. It's an extraordinarily vivid image in my mind, and I dare say for anyone else who was around at the time. It was a time of firsts. The first time we at home flew a flag from the bedroom window of our house. Two, in fact, the tricolour on one side and the papal colours on the other. It was the first time our street was really cleaned. So clean, I thought the Pope might be doing a grand tour in his Pope mobile. And it was the first time the Pope came to Ireland. But why this Pope, and why Ireland so early? I mean, the man was hardly a wet day in the Vatican. If anyone should know, Bishop of Cline John McGee would. Then Father McGee, he was Private Secretary to Pope John Paul II in 1979. When he called me and he said, he said to me, you know, the Irish and the Polish are very alike. He said, we have, from a spiritual point of view, we have had um, a long tradition of special devotions. And the devotions have been th threefold. He said, devotion to the Eucharist, devotion to Mary, and devotion to the person of the Pope. And he said, there are three countries that I would like to visit in this first year of my pontificate. I will go to Mexico, but then I will go to Poland and then to Ireland. Those were to be his three visits of the year, of that first year. And he said, I want to give to each of those nations a title. And he did. In each of those nations, he gave each nation a title. And that is Semper Fidelis, always faithful. And that was the reason why those three countries were chosen. Despite what the Americans might say, the Americans say that he went to Ireland on the way to America. The fact is, he went to Ireland uh, on the, the, the jumbo jet St. Patrick, and I was with him, and it was arranged that he would go on from there to Boston and then go to the United Nations, and we did our visit to America, added on to the Irish visit, not an American visit with a drop down in Ireland, and that is the fact. How much did he know about Ireland at the time? He had read a lot about Ireland. He had a great um, knowledge of the Legion of Mary and of Frank Duff. He had a, a great knowledge of Matt Talbot. He actually wrote a book before he became Pope in Polish on Matt Talbot. So he had a great knowledge of, of the spirituality of Ireland. He had um, 
often spoken to me before coming to Ireland about these mass rocks. He wanted to know about the mass rocks because he had heard about them. It is significant that during his visit in Ireland, it's the only time that the Pope did not celebrate in a church in Ireland. He celebrated outside in all of the events. And in fact, in keeping with almost with the tradition that went back to the penal times when Mass was celebrated in the open. And the theme for the great encounter in um, Phoenix Park was the theme he himself chose because in reading up history, he had found that there was a statement made uh, in the House of Commons uh, in England uh, in response to a question, why can you not control these Irish? And the answer from the Viceroy was, it's the Mass that matters, because people were gathering together for the Mass, and they were not able to control, because there was a law which did not permit more than a certain number of people to gather together at a particular time. But the Mass rocks were the places where the people met and celebrated Mass. And the theme of the Holy Father's Mass in Phoenix Park was, it's the Mass that matters, the words that were used in the British House of Commons. As I stand here in the company of so many hundreds of thousands of Irish men and women, I am thinking small matter where the mass was offered for the Irish. It was always the mass that mattered. So here's my papal stool, right? And I'm about to put it down here, right? Now that's what I'm going to do now, right? I haven't opened it actually in a while. Isn't it still looking very good? It's beautiful. 1979, <laughs> Cleary's best. We all got them. <laughs> papal stools were all the rage back in 79. In fact, you can still see them in use today, usually at the St. Patrick's Day parade. But I digress. Porrigine was one of the one and a quarter million people who made the journey to see the Pope in the Phoenix Park. She, along with family and friends and a few thousand others, were in Corral B27, somewhere, she says, between the trees and the altar. And it was there she told me about the day she saw the Pope. There was a ritual kind of silence, the sense of, God, something, something magical is happening, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, that whole sense of a sea of people moving together in unison, that was, will always stay with me. And the sun coming up over the park will always stay with me as well. And then, of course, we were all waiting like for hours, you see, and then at 10 o'clock or so, the plane flew over. And everybody gets out the flags, you know, you think that he could see us. I mean, they said that he, well, we believed that he could because it was a clear day. But we all waved. It must have been an extraordinary sight from the air. Everybody trying to see and wave. And I mean, I really felt he got very close to us. And I know that another friend of mine was saying, oh, he looked at me. One of the little girls was saying, he looked at me, he looked at me. <laughs> that kind of thing, you know, that we really felt that we were being blessed but did in he some look way. And I remember the sense of feeling of there was fun in it. The Pope has a great sense of humour. And of course, there were tunes being played out over the park, like kind of, ballads that didn't even go with it in a way I remember there was one ballad being played um, a dear to you my darling you know that well um, uh, the holy ground once more fine girl you are I remember that was being blasted out over the park but it was the atmosphere while he was going through the crowds you know fine girl. Corrigine was saying that people believed they could see the Pope blessing them from the plane as it flew over the park. And I must confess, as a 12-year-old then in Corral D22, so did I. Uh, I remember being a little worried coming to Ireland on the 29th of September. I had said, I do not know what the weather will be like. And it was an amazing surprise to come in over Ireland uh, of course, in the aeroplane, we did not realize that there was a very strong wind blowing, but the sky was clear. There was a brilliant sun. And uh, I remember just as we came in over the Wexford coast and we came into Irish airspace, two jets of the Air Corps came alongside on either side of the aeroplane. I was sitting with the Holy Father and he was reading over... Uh, the, the homily he was, he was to give that day in Phoenix Park. 
And I just touched him. I said, look, Holy Father. And he looked out. And it seemed as if you could almost touch the plane, the jet plane, on the side where the Holy Father was. And then I pointed to the one on the other side. And then he gave a very copious blessing to them so that they would see. And he kept blessing them, you see. And the, the, the pilots in the, in the jet air, aircraft started to bless themselves. So I had to say to the Holy Father, please, Holy Father, they're traveling at a very great speed. Please don't give them any more blessings because we could have disaster. And he laughed. But then the next thing was um, we were coming in over uh, Phoenix Park and the air hostess announced, or was it the, 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 the pilot? But we were told we are now coming in over Phoenix Park. So he got up uh, and moved on from the, to get to a, a bigger window, went into the seat and knelt on the, was kneeling on the seat so as to get a good view of Phoenix Park as we flew over. And we could see this enormous crowd and, and the blessing. And the, and the two planes were still on either side of us as we, as we flew in over Phoenix Park. And just as we were flying in and he was blessing the people and waving, um, the air hostess said, um, Your Holiness, uh, the papal entourage, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are now about to land at Dublin Airport. I would request that you would return to your seats, fasten your seat belts, and prepare for landing. And he turned back to go back to his seat, and he looked at me, and I said to him, with my heart filled with emotion, I said, Holy Father, welcome to Ireland. Welcome to my country. And he said, At long last, I have always wanted to come to Ireland. I am here now. Thank God. And that was, that was uh, what happened. And then, of course, we, we landed uh, at the airport, which is still marked with the, the spot where he landed. An interesting point about the Pope's flight over the park. He flew into Dublin on an Aer Lingus 747. What's so big about that, I hear you cry? Well, consider this. The Pope always flies Alitalia. So how come he ended up on the St. Patrick? John Griffin was sales manager for Aer Lingus based in Rome when rumours were about that the Pope might visit Ireland. Once the trip looked like it might happen, this was sometime around the end of June, beginning of July 1979, I was asked as the manager initially to check out the possibility of the Pope flying with Aer Lingus because the precedent had been that whenever the Pope left Italy, he always flew Alitalia and he always did up to then and after the Ireland trip he has always flown Alitalia since so the only occasion when the Pope left Italy on a non Alitalia aircraft was when he came to Ireland so that was a, a particularly successful coup from a sales point of view. But how did you do it? What was the mechanism? It was like any, any sort of good sales trip you had to sort of check out the options who were the key players and the six foot five ex quarterback from Cicero, Illinois, uh, Archbishop Marcinkus was known worldwide as the Pope, papal security man, his travel manager, looked after all the arrangements. So I had to go and see him. At that time, he was head of the Vatican Bank, the IOR, and he, he hit, you know, publicity for other reasons later on, but at that stage, he was the key person in the Vatican dealing with where the Pope would travel, how the travel rates would be made, security considerations, which airline and what conditions and so on the trip would be would be conducted. So uh, with directions from our head office in Dublin and from David Kennedy, who was our chief executive, I was detailed to go over to the Vatican, talk to the right people and make sure that we were going to be considered as the carrier for the Pope. And how important was it to Aer Lingus to have the Pope fly into Ireland? on an Aer Lingus jet? Well, I suppose it was important for Aer Lingus as a national airline, but it was also important for the Irish people because this once-in-a-lifetime experience, if the Pope arrived in Ireland on somebody else's airplane, they'd say, what are these guys in Aer Lingus doing? I mean, you know, this is a one-off. We won't get two chances at this. He can fly to Italy every month, every week, going on other places. So we had to start the contingency planning, the preparation, the investment and lots of services before we had a confirmation in writing and I, was, I said, look, don't worry about it. I have a good authority. We have no problem. There's just a few bits of paper to be signed off. But Bar Bishop Marcinkus confirms the Pope will fly our lingus. This that, must have been an awful slap in the face to Alitalia. Well, it was indeed. And in fact, one of the things that happened, and even two weeks before the trip, which was the end of September in 79, Alitalia had a permanent representative in the Vatican who looked after all the Vatican business worldwide. And there was a rear guard action right up to the very end 
to get us to accept just flying the Pope from Ireland onto the States. And we get a bit of publicity that way. But that they would fly him out of Italy into Ireland. And we stood firm. Uh, all our people who were supporting us, including the people in the Vatican, said, no, we have agreed to go with our lingus and we'll honour the commitment. So at that stage, we had the 747, which had the upper deck area. And the, the papal entourage, just to give you the kind of background, the papal entourage would be the Holy Father, the Secretary of State, a number of private secretaries, and various security people and other personnel, about 24, 25 people in total. So we were being asked to carry the Holy Father on a special airplane, and because there was transatlantic sector involved, we needed to put in a private apartment which would give him a reading area where he could meet some VIPs, and also a rest area on the other side of the aircraft. So the upper deck was transformed into the special lounge, half of which was a lounge, the other half was a sleeping area with a six-foot uh, long bed. And that was used on the transatlantic sector from Shannon to Boston. Other than that, within the aircraft were special menus designed, crews were trained, announcements had to be made, obviously in Polish as well as English and Irish and Italian. And, uh, you know, looking at what kind of menu the Holy Father had, any particular food that he would eat. And the food, was it prepared in any different way than it would be for normal passengers? Well, l- what were the security implications is well, what I'm asking Well, the you. food was all prepared in Dublin. The aircraft came down on the night before, so all the food was brought down from Dublin. And with the hot breakfast on board the aircraft, as you probably know, they are cooked on board, they're prepared and then they're cooked on the aircraft. So it was served up piping hot on the morning, after, about a half an hour after we left Rome. Mm. And the Irish breakfast started off with fairly traditional orange juice, grapefruit cocktail, then bacon, sausage, black and white pudding, grilled tomato, then followed by cheese biscuits, rolls and butter and tea and coffee. I think it's fair to say that people would have given their right arms to meet the Pope. Not necessarily to say anything to him, just to meet him would have been enough. Russell was nine when, after a lengthy interview by men in green suits, he was chosen to present flowers to the Pope on his arrival at Dublin Airport. Aer Lingus were looking for two children to present flowers to the Pope when he arrived in Dublin Airport. So what they did was they asked everybody in Aer Lingus, did they have children and did they want to put them forward to present flowers? And my mum heard this through, I think my uncle, and... um, she asked me would I like to meet the Pope and the age of nine you know <laughs> it's like well you know he hadn't been to Ireland before and it was a big thing and everything so I said yeah it'd be great and we went for interviews so at the age of nine <laughs> teeth <laughs> falling out your head and everything you know and you had a big fangs and everything and then um, you go in and they sit down you know like what sports do you like and they went through a load of things and um, I just couldn't stop smiling just <laughs> yeah what am I doing here so later on a few weeks later I got a call to say I had been chosen, myself and a girl called Lisa Drumgill had been chosen to present flowers in Dublin Airport. So with that, my mum was ecstatic. She, you know, she really thought the idea was great and everything. And she, soon enough, word got around the neighbourhood and everything. And so I was the boy in school and everything, you know, the papers, these are the two people who meet the Pope and everything. Sure enough, a few days before I went in and with an Aer Lingus member of staff to get a suit to wear. A <laughs> suit? A suit, and of course it's green and it's velvet, <laughs> I think. <laughs> but then, um, what was incredible was, um, it was actually the press. For bef- before we met the Pope, there was, um, I remember American, I remember being hit in the head by a steel file by an American press person who actually tried to corner me over and talk to me without other people talking <laughs> and I kept clambered and being pulled like left right and I remember uh, the evening press and there was a her- you know the press were out and everything I think the Herald were out as well and the, and the guy the, whoever was from the evening press turned around and said um, what would you like to be when you grow up and I said um, an engineer because my father was an engineer and he was you know involved in Aer Lingus and all and at the time you know I was nine I said yeah I'd love to be an engineer and he said what else do you want to be I said a teacher What else do you want to be? And I knew exactly what they were getting at. They wanted me to say, I want to be a Pope or a priest or something. (laughs) Even at the age of nine? Yeah. So the third thing I said, yeah, okay, a priest. And sure enough, the next day in the paper, (laughs) boy meets Pope wants to be priest. (laughs) On the second page, it was very funny. So we got carted off and we brought down and we were rehearsed in what we were to do and everything. And um, everybody was like, we were all really tense and frightened. You know, this is the person, this is the Pope, this is the big man and everything. And, um, you know, the whole of Ireland was out that day to see Mm. it. The whole of Ireland, every single person. The red carpet was rolled out and everything, and the plane arrived in. And um, myself and Lisa are like two little frightened kids being told what to do, where to go and everything. 
And then as soon as um, he, came, he said a speech and he just walked off from the podium and was walking down the red carpet. And uh, it was kind of, we were let go and, you know, march that way, go that way. So we had the flowers and went up, handed the flowers over. And it was like, what do you say? And you kind of go, there you go, thank you, you know. <laughs> and he turns around and says, do you speak Polish? I couldn't believe it. Do you speak Polish? Nine years of age, a little Irish kid <laughs> in, a, in something that isn't exactly in fashion, a little green suit and everything. And um, he says, do you speak Polish? And with that I said, uh, no. And I, no didn't sound right. So I said, no, thank you. <laughs> and with that he kissed us on the head, gave us rosary beads. So you did this, there was the big build-up to it and everybody was patting you on the head and you were brilliant and all that kind of stuff. What was the reaction afterwards when then the, people saw you do it? At the time, it was, yes, it was big, because uh, 1979, the Pope was much more important than well, 1979. He was, he was Yeah, exactly. Pope John Paul especially, because he was, you know, a really people's Pope, mm. as opposed to other Popes. And even, I remember, um, the woman across the road used to cut people's hair and everything, and... Um, like, there was a piece of hair in my head which was cut off to be kept, you know, it's where the Pope kissed it. <laughs> That's how far it went, you know. I enjoyed it, and it still comes up in conversation today, 20 years later. It still comes up. The itinerary for Pope John Paul II was one of the most gruelling ever arranged for a visiting dignitary. Seven venues in two and a half days. He's reported to have said jokingly that the Irish tried to kill him. But this didn't stop the young pontiff, who lived by the adage, in for a penny, in for a pound. He was so full of life, so, so eager to, 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 to get on with that visit. And one of the, one of the late nights, uh, it was the first night, and that was the night he said I, they nearly killed me. Um, because, you see, he came to, uh, to um, Phoenix Park, and then we went to uh, Drogheda. We went to Aris Nucron. I remember he planted a tree there. I'm sure it's quite a big tree now. And um, then he had the, the drive through Dublin. And there were a lot of people who were wanting him to come to the church of Matt Talbot. I remember we passed it. It is interesting, the Pope never visited the pro-cathedral in Dublin, never entered it. Which is strange now, because in every visit, he visits every cathedral where he goes what, to whatever city or diocese he goes to. But at that time, it was decided, because the, the visit was short, so short, that he had so much to do. And that night, he had the encounter with the, with the press. And uh, we were two hours late. And he, he, was, he was rather reluctant to, uh, to go to the press, uh, being so late. Uh, he said, I'm not going to give a speech. He said, I, I couldn't. I said, Holy Father, it's already been distributed to them. They have the text. I said, you don't have to say anything. You just present yourself. And he said, OK. And where are they? And they were in a room, and we came out on a balcony at the nunciature, and he, he went over, and there was a, a lot of noise going on down. Uh, they didn't see him coming. So when he appeared at the top of the balcony, uh, and he, he looked at all this vast crowd of journalists from, from all of Ireland and from all over the world. He began to beat his breast. He didn't say anything, he just beat his breast as a gesture of, of sorrow and penitence. I've kept you waiting. And what did they do? They responded by singing with a wonderful rousing uh, sound, for he's a jolly good fellow. He couldn't believe it. And then, he, he, as he often did, he used to knock on the, on the microphone to, to, to get them to, to quieten down so that he could say something. And he said, you say, I am a jolly good fellow. And I keep you waiting for two hours. How was that? For he's a jolly good fellow. They started again. So say all of us now. John Paul II was the name he chose, 
not many of us have the choice when it comes to our names. Now, unfortunately, I can't tell you how many children were born on the 29th of September, the day the Pope came to Ireland, because these statistics don't exist. Nor can I tell you how many boys were called John Paul in memory of his visit. But just look around you. How many JPs do you know? It was my birthday on the day before the Pope came, and instead of doing anything exciting, we decided we would paper a sitting room. During the papering of the sitting room, the cracks began to appear, not in the wallpaper, but in the labour pens, and I went into labour. Went into Hollis Street and had a long and excruciatingly painful labour because it was our first baby. And the nurses kept saying, you know, it's the day, the Pope is coming, everything is going to be great, it's going to be brilliant. And I remember saying at one stage, if the Pope came down the corridor, I would tell him very impolitely to go away because he was a man. And I never wanted to see a man for as long as I lived <laughs> again, ever, <laughs> because I was in labour and God was a man and all that sort of stuff at that stage. Paul was born then at quarter to seven in the morning. Um, it sort of ended all the pain and the grief and then the great fun began and ringing around and telling everybody. I and then uh, whose idea then was it to call Paul, as you call him now, John Paul? Paul. Well, my father, um, his name was Sean, and I would have liked to have called Paul after my father. And we said John Paul, but then uh, Jim's father was Peter, so various discussions ensued, and in true uh, judicial democratic fashion, <laughs> we decided we would call him John Paul. Um, my father and mother, who lived down the country, didn't have a phone at the time, so uh, they were really delighted. It, was, it meant an awful lot to them that he was called John Paul. Uh, my neighbours came in, or our neighbours at home came in to tell them that he was born. They immediately, at 11 o'clock in the morning, I think they came in, they immediately opened a bottle, which would be most unlike them at home, and they celebrated his arrival. But I blame the Pope for knocking the whole romance out of my life. Firstborn child, sitting up pretty in the hospital, bit of blusher on, looking lovely. And in comes my beloved husband, Jim, carrying flowers. And I said, where'd you get the flowers? And he kind of looked at me sheepishly. Well, it was all the Pope's fault. I couldn't go up to any shops to buy the flowers because all the shops are closed because of the Pope. Yeah. So I got them in my back garden. I said, oh, OK, that was it. <laughs> so, John Paul, you were named after the Pope. Yeah, yet he had no hand or part in your conception. Uh, no, I didn't even know he was there. <laughs> so, I mean, did, 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 did your mates know you were called John Paul after the Pope? Did you ever get a, a ribbing over it, or were people delighted for you? Not or? really. No one really uh, kind of knew until I went to school. When I went to school, like secondary school, I was called John Paul. They used to call my name John Paul because it was on my birth cert. And they go, oh, why are you called John Paul? You know, teachers would say, and I'd explain, oh, the day of the Pope or whatever, and that would be about it. Like, other than that, nothing was ever really said. So 20 years later, and it'll be your birthday the day this programme is broadcast, so happy yep. birthday to you. Thanks. <laughs> are you happy you called him John Paul, and are you happy being called John Paul? Start with you, Maureen. Well, I think it's nice, yeah. It's very significant. On the day he was born, the Pope came to Ireland. I don't know if the Pope will ever come to Ireland again. Everybody has their own memories of that day. It was like, you know, this concept of flashbulb memory. You, everybody knows where they were when JFK died. Well, I certainly know where I was when John Paul arrived. I will never forget it. I haven't that much memorabilia of the day. I was very disorganised at the time. I should have kept newspapers and all that sort of thing. Mm. I have one thing. I have a stamp that was issued for the visit of the Pope to Ireland. But the stamp is a physical thing. But in my memory, I have the mental stamp. I don't think I'll forget that, ever. I ah, Yes, I'm happy I've called him John Paul. And you're happy with the name? Oh, yeah, it's grand. It doesn't bother me at all. So there's nothing I can do with it now, anyway. Maureen Tully and her son John Paul. We all have different memories of where we saw the Pope when he came to Ireland, whether it was at the race course in Limerick, the Shrine in Knock, the Phoenix Park in Dublin or in Drogheda, or simply watching it at home on TV. But for many people, the highlight of the visit was Galway. It was here the Pope would meet the youth of Ireland. This didn't mean that adults weren't welcome. On the contrary, they were, and quite a few made the journey with their kids, among them Larry and Eileen. My mother and father went to the Eucharistic Congress, which is in 1932. I remember him always talking about the people going to it on the trains and the trams. It was something I always had in my memory. And then this occasion came when the Pope was planning to come to Ireland. And I just thought, well, it would be nice to go to the Youth Mass, which was in uh, Galway, rather than go to the one in Dublin. 
and I asked Ellen would she like to come and she said God she think that's a great idea because all our boys were then were very young they were in around our 10 11 and 12 and we had Damien Kieran, Tara and Larkin they were all very young at the time when we decided to go we were watching here on television when the Pope arrived on the television you we were, were actually watching. shaving at the time you said I? so I mustn't have been long off at that stage <laughs> you said to me come on we better get going yeah Galway's a long way off yeah and then we I made this huge big stew and a couple of apple tarts and we took off anyway and lots of cookies and biscuits and the lot and uh, we were well packed for the day so we took off anyway and we had a great journey going down and we arrived anyway and the place was packed and we I said to you where on earth are we going to get a parking space here there's so many people. We had a big van. We had a big fact. van, you see. It wasn't just a car. We, we were well loaded. And we put it in anyway. And it wasn't that far off from where the boat was supposed to arrive. And then the next thing, we unloaded. And we made a big pot of tea. And the lads were hyper. <laughs> they were great for. And the next thing, the army helicopter arrived. Well, the excitement of that, honestly, they nearly knocked me over trying to get to get to the helicopter so then the Pope arrived and we, we could see the, the plane coming and the excitement was starting to build and all of a sudden he was standing on this platform talking to the, the youth of Ireland and it was the most wonderful feeling out came over me I got goose pimples listening to him you know I really did feel very close to God that day and I looked down at my children and I said, thank God for them, and they were all so healthy. He talked quite a lot, the Pope did, to the, to the people. It was absolutely fantastic. How many young people have already warped their consciences and have substituted the true joy of life with drugs? sex, alcohol, vandalism, and the empty pursuit of mere material possessions. Something else is needed. Young people of Ireland, I love you. Although the Pope had a team of writers, those words and thoughts, young people of Ireland, I love you, were his own. He had a drafting team, I was part of it, and uh, he, he, he worked on all of those talks and he had uh, Cardinal Daly come from Ireland to work with him as well on those on all of those talks. But that was one thing he wanted to say. Because in all of his visits, he always wanted an encounter with youth. And he wanted always to say to the youth, I love you. I love you in the purest sense of the word, I love you. And so he said to the people of Ireland, people of Ireland, I love you. Now, there, there are a distinction. He always wrote his uh, homilies for all his, uh, his uh, liturgical celebrations. He would write those in Polish. For the uh, other occasions, which were occasions like meeting at airports and uh, uh, occasions of speaking to the press or speaking to, to religious, uh, speaking to youth or whatever, he would say, this is what I want to say on this occasion. He would plan it with his planners and they would go off. Now they would send back a draft and sometimes he would just rehash that whole thing and say, no, put it in, uh, change it and so on. But. Uh, Oh, he takes possession of everything he says. So those words, young people of Ireland, I love you. They were his, yes. His own words. They were his own words, yes. Galway was different. The Pope himself was uplifted by the experience. And the weather was good. No thanks to the Pope who tried to inspire the rain gods with this ancient Polish rain chant.
He may have been number one with the youth of Ireland, but his singing never made it to the hit parade. Dana did with Totus Tuus. So too did Jim Tobin with Welcome John Paul II. But top of the pops for me was Katrina Walsh, Viva Il Papa. Viva Il Papa, hear the people sing. From the heart of Ireland, let a great welcome ring. Viva Il Papa, may peace bless his way. The nations rejoicing. On the Holy Father's Day Sing If we had a dream to see the Pope The Pope too had a dream To come to Ireland and to be with the sick At the Marian Shrine in Knock Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Faithful sons and daughters of Mary Here I am at the goal of my journey to Ireland. The shrine of Our Lady at Knock. Since I first learned of the centenary of this shrine, which is being celebrated this year, I have felt a strong desire to come here, the desire to make yet another pilgrimage to the shrine of the Mother of Christ, the Mother of the Church, the Queen of the Peace, the liturgy of the world of today's Mass, gives me my pilgrims salutation to Mary as now I come before her in Ireland's Marian shrine at Knock Mure. If there was one regret the Pope had about his visit to Ireland it was the fact that he never made it to Armagh. The visit of the Holy Father initially included a visit to Armagh. The plan was already there Every detail of the visit of the Holy Father to Armagh was, was fixed. But then, unfortunately, the killing of Lord Mountbatten changed all of that. And that was, in fact, the Holy Father said at the time to me, now is the time, above all, to go and be with those people who suffer. All of them. Because this is a blow not just to one section of the community, it is a blow to the whole community. But then... Uh, security uh, advised that he would not go to Armagh at that particular time, and that there might be another occasion. And so it was decided that he would go into the ecclesiastical province of Armagh, and that was why he went to Drada. And he went to Drada to make, I beg, and go down on my knees and I beg men of violence to stop the violence. Now, I wish to speak to all men and women engaged in violence. I appeal to you in language of passionate pleading. On my knees, I beg you to turn away from the path of violence and to return to the ways of peace. I too believe in justice and seek justice, but violence only delays the day of justice. Violence destroys the work of justice. Further violence in Ireland will only drag down to ruin the land you claim to love and the values you claim to cherish. In the name of God, I beg you, return to Christ who died so that men might live in forgiveness and peace. He is waiting for you, longing for each one of you to come to him so that he may say to each of you, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace.
Every time I have met him since I left Rome in 1987, he has said, I want to go back to Ireland. Get me back to Ireland. I think he would come back if uh, the occasion was ripe. But when we were leaving, they sang at the airport, Will he no come back again? You know that song. He said to us, he said, Yes, I will come back to Ireland again, but only if I can visit Northern Ireland. And after the peace process was signed, I went to Rome for the ordination to the diaconate of one of my students in Rome. And the very first thing the Holy Father said to me, before I even greeted him, he caught me by the hand and he said, the peace agreement is good. Now is the time to return and finish the work I began in Drogheda. And I suppose... Now that I am a bishop down here in Cork, Cork was always considered the county that he flew over and didn't visit. Uh, the people in Cork would say, uh, and on condition that he would visit Cork. And I think in this particular year, in 20 years afterwards, we have great, great motives for celebrating, and it would be a, a, a super motive were the Holy Father to come and visit Cork and perhaps take a ship, as I have travelled with him on, by ship in various places, and come up the River Lee up to the beautiful Cathedral of Cove for the Diocese of Clyne. We could certainly make a great occasion for him to come into Cork, but his priority would be to go to the primatial sea of St. Patrick in Armagh and to meet the people of Northern Ireland. That is his wish and that is his prayer. It's hard to believe that one man could touch the hearts of a nation the way John Paul II did in 1979. I'm not sure it could ever happen again. What I do know is that at that time, in this place, it felt good. And it was the most wonderful feeling out came over me. I got goose pimples listening to him, you know. I really did feel very close to God that day. And I looked down at my children and I said, thank God for them and they were all so healthy. It was absolutely fantastic. Mora, go, Joe, let's 